Amid the many reflections this week on the life of George H.W. Bush, few knew him as well or worked as closely on the major accomplishments of his presidency as his longtime friend and his Secretary of State, James Baker. Baker joined me a short time ago to offer an intimate look back at the 41st president, beginning before either men entered politics. He and Barbara moved back to Houston, or moved to Houston in 1958, which was just one year after I moved back to Houston from law school, having uh, gone to college at Princeton in the Marine Corps and then to law school. So I did, we both sort of hit the ground there about the same time, even though it was my home. Uh, and neither George nor I had uh, a tennis doubles partner for the, for the tennis doubles uh, competition at the uh, Houston Country Club, and they put us together. And the Bushes asked us to come over and have hamburger lunches and things like We got to be friends that way, social friends. My first wife, who died very tragically at the age of 38, had known uh, George's cousin in, in Ohio. And uh, that was another uh, uh, connection. After my wife died, he came to me and he said, you know, Beck, you got to take your mind off your grief. How about helping me run for the Senate? Well, in those days, Texas was a solidly Democratic state, as Democratic right. then as it is Republican today. I said, George, I, I, that's great, but I don't know anything about politics. And no, number one, number two, I'm a Democrat. He said, well, we can change that latter thing <laughs> we did. He came to the relationship already loving politics, uh, excited Well, no, about this was before he went into politics, but he okay. was the son of a, of a very distinguished uh, United States senator, of course, so he had a, a political background to, to that extent, but he hadn't gotten into politics. His first foray into politics was in the early 60s. After we, ah. came, we met in the in late 50s, and he ran for county chairman, started right where he, where I guess you should start, right at the bottom, and worked his way up to president of the United States. He was county chairman of the Republican Party of Texas. In those days, it was a hanging offense to be a Republican <laughs> in Texas. I'm not kidding you. He came to love politics. It, it was in oh, his yeah. blood. He yeah, talked yeah, yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. What was it about public service that he that drew him to it? Well, I think he, the example of his father, for one thing. We'd be campaigning. He would have. He, he'd say, "My father inculcated in me." Uh, 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 a commitment to public service. I said, George, don't stay inculcated. <laughs> people think that people think it's a disease. People in Texas don't understand that. But he had a commitment to, to public service, uh, selfless public service, and that was he 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 practiced that all of his life. He was in Congress. He was the ambassador to China. He was ambassador he was to the UN. Ambassador to the UN. He was uh, head of the CIA. Head, head of the Republican National Committee under. President and Nixon. vice president for two terms. And by, you were in the room when Ronald Reagan called him right. at the 1980 National Convention. That's right. It changed his life. Yeah, how, that's right. How, how did if he, he hadn't gotten that call, I, he has said, and, and I believe firmly, there would not have been a, a Bush 41. And if there was not been a Bush 41, Bush 43 has said there wouldn't have been a Bush 43, and I believe that too. So. Yeah, I was in the room. I answered the phone. How did he change the presidency of Ronald Reagan? Did he? No, I really don't think so. But but he, he, he was a very loyal vice president. He understood the job. He knew how it was supposed to be performed, and he performed it that way. He never let himself be juxtaposed against the president. He kept his advice to the president private. He didn't... Ex uh, uh, throw it out there in public meetings because he knew that there's nothing is secret here in, here in Washington, D.C. So, uh, so when he started running for president, he had to separate himself somewhat. It, it couldn't be seen to be a third, in effect, a third Reagan term. Uh, and he successfully did that. First time anybody's done it since 1856, a sitting vice president uh, to get elected president. You were so close to him. Did he do what he wanted to get done as president of the United States? Well, no, because he didn't have a second term. But he was there for four years. Oh, yes. He, he, his presidency was an extraordinarily consequential presidency. If you look at it, you look at the things that he got done. And I was, of course, I'm, 
<laughs> I'm a little biased because I was there serving at his right hand as Secretary of State. Much of that was on the foreign policy side. He was an incredibly good foreign policy president, but he had some domestic achievements as well, some rather big ones. How did his loss affect him in 90, oh, 1992? Oh, it was devastating. He, he was devastated by that loss. And, uh, you know, I, I read a lot today, uh, uh, comments, uh, uh, pundits, and so forth, saying he lost because he broke his, pre he broke his no new taxes pledge. That's not why he lost, Judy. Everybody ought to get that straight. I ran that campaign, and I saw it every day in the polling. He lost because of a little guy from Dallas, Texas, called Ross Perot, who took 19% of the vote, and we knew from our polling he was taking two out of every three votes from us. We got 38, Clinton got 43. You right. had two-thirds of 19 to 38, and we get 51. But that loss, it, while as tough as it was, he went on to be active for another, what, 20, 25, 26 yeah, yeah, 25 years, years of well, his life. 20, yeah, 25 or 26, that's so correct. So it didn't, it didn't slow him down. I mean, he kept No, he but kept it, was, going. it was devastating to him. He's a, it, you know, uh, during that 92 campaign, pe some people would say, well, his heart's not really in it. He doesn't really want it. He's not. Uh uh, most competitive man I've ever known in my life, and I don't know why people missed that, but they but they did. But that's but but to say he was competitive, and yet people say he was a gentleman, he was a decent he man. He was. A lot of people think the two things don't no, coexist. No, they're not mutually exclusive. He was a, he was a gentleman. He was, a, but but he was a man of steely resolve, and uh, and when he decided he wanted to do something or was going to do something. There wasn't any swerving out of the, you know, there was no detours on that. Was he aware, how much did he pay attention the last few years to how Washington has changed? What did he think about Washington? What's going on in Washington? Well, uh, he found it uh, ugly up here compared to the way it was when we were here. Uh, and when we were here, uh, people came up here with the idea that they wanted to get something done for the people, for the American people have done for the country. And there was a lot of bipartisanship, a lot of reaching across the aisle for both, both parties. And, and, and another thing is that people that come to Washington don't bring their families anymore. That's right. A congressman comes up here, the, the Congress only meets from Tuesday afternoon till Thursday afternoon, and they go back to raise money for next back. year's uh, campaigns or two years campaigns. So they don't bring their families. There's no social interaction across party lines the way there used to be. We had good friends, really, really good friends who were uh, Democrats. Let me ask you to put your Secretary of State hat on. Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of yeah. conversation right now after the death, the murder of a journalist, Jamal yeah, Khashoggi. Yeah. This administration has tread lightly when it comes to Saudi Arabia, but well, you now have Republican as well as Democratic yeah, senators you do. saying... I know, I know, and you want me to comment on something that's current news, and I think that's great. When you formulate and implement foreign policy for, the, for America, you've got to consider not only America's uh, interests, national interests, but also our principles and values. So you have to strike a balance. And the job facing this administration is to strike the right balance. Who knows whether this is the right balance? And, and, the, and the story's not over yet. There's probably, as you point out, with the, re, with the Republicans in the Congress saying what they're saying, it may go uh, another way. But, can but, you... the, but the national interest is very important, too. Very last quick question. Do you think the kind of civility that we saw during the presidency of George H. W. Bush will ever come back. come back. Yeah, I, mean, I was asked that question uh, yesterday, I guess, or the day before. Yes, I think it will come back. I really do. Uh, uh, civility in our in our politics. We need to we need to stop yelling each other at each other as a nation and start listening to each other. Uh, it, it is really it is really regrettable because the way you get things done. You know, in our democracy, no one side gets to make all the rules, okay? And the way you get things done is to work constructively with the other side uh, in, uh, to, to benefit the national interest. And I think we'll get back to that someday. I sure hope we will. Let me say this, the fault is on both sides. The incivility exists on both sides. When you look at some of the things that some prominent 
Democrats have said recently, and I'm not going to quote, I'm not kidding, you know what I'm talking about. So it's, you, you see it both, both ways. Of course, you're talking to a, uh, an adversarial Republican when you talk to me. I run, I've run campaigns for Republican presidents, three of them, or four if you want to put it that yes, way. Yes, you have. Mm -hmm. Secretary of State Jim Baker, thank you thank very much for thank talking to me. Thank you, Judy. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it.